I think like most people that get into marketing, I kind of fell into marketing. When I was in university, I started kind of playing around with SEO. I got a job at a tiny agency that was nearby my university and I started to learn the business side of things, figuring out, you know, this this was just as the the rise of content marketing started to happen and the, the blogging revolution. So it was an interesting time in 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 the space was spending a lot of time working on my own personal brand, pushing out like content that I thought was interesting. And Brian Halligan, the CEO of HubSpot, somehow stumbled across an article that I wrote. Long story short, I was hired and moved from initially running and building the global search team, then to owning the acquisition team. And now I'm the VP of marketing. So aside from HubSpot, the thing that's probably closest to my heart at the moment is Traffic Think Tank. It's a, uh, an online community and community building is something that I love. I've always been fascinated with how to build and cultivate engaged communities. And I was fortunate enough in my career to go through several waves of major technological change and dramatically changed how communities are formed, whether that's niche forums that I was involved in early on through to blogging, the rise of the sharing economy, marketplaces, and now where we sit with the new wave of the creator or passion economy that, that is starting to form. It's nearly always prioritization. This happens across companies of all stages, but the repercussions of getting this wrong are really amplified when you're an early stage company. The areas where founders often struggle is they either pick the wrong thing to spend all their time on, or more commonly, a peanut butter spread, right? They do a whole lot of things a very small amount, and the net of that ends up being a whole lot of nothing. And I think that's the, the key area of focus outside of getting away from specific tactics and channels. Everything's different for every company. There have been too many humbling moments that I have, uh, that I have witnessed. Failing is really, really important. Now, learning from those failures is much more important. Your, your goal should not be not to fail, it's not to make the same mistake twice. Uh, and mistakes come in all kinds of forms. It's not about, oh, I thought this tactic would work and it didn't. It's like, well, you know, as long as you evaluated the opportunity well and there was a chance, this, this is kind of good. I think the things where I've learned the most, if I had to bucket a lot of the these these lessons into a single theme is understanding and learning how to influence people and influence their decisions and it's about understanding what they care about there's a lot of nuance here and i think this comes back to prioritization Pulling the wrong lever is something that happens a lot. Uh, an example that I always come back to is companies will start out trying to gain organic growth by say, all right, we're going to publish, let's just take a simple example, we're going to publish 10 blog posts per week and they don't see results uh, for a, a few weeks and they say, okay, well, let, let's try something different. Let's try 15 blog posts per week. And then that doesn't work. And then they're like, let's try 20 blog posts per week. And then you apply that same logic to something like paid acquisition. You say, we just, we'll spend 100K this month on paid acquisition. And uh, we're not seeing return on investment. Let's spend 200K the next month. Let's spend 500K. Let's spend a million the next month. You would never do that, right? So, but this happens a lot within organic search. And it's about understanding like, you know, is that actually the right lever or is there something else we need to focus on? First of all, in SaaS, you should be changing pricing and adjusting pricing very frequently. But if I had to give listeners right now one starting point, it would be to understand the different ways to think about pricing and the approaches and frameworks and models to use for pricing. So things like 
understanding the difference between value-based pricing, and then you have cost-plus-based pricing, and then you've got things like competitor-based pricing. The challenge with those last two, right, is that it's, qu it's quite difficult to adjust pricing a lot because it, a lot of that pricing would be adjusting not necessarily in line with the perceived value of the product that your customers and potential customers see. With value-based pricing, your price can be very fluid. I think this is uh, the closest alignment you have, which is like customer delight and willingness to pay for certain features in particular and aspects of your, your product or service offering and the, uh, and the actual price that you set for those products. The big thing that we probably seen some major tailwinds from right, has been driving people into educational content, um, especially near the start of the year around that like March to May period during a lot of the first kind of global lockdowns that happened. People were very much in the spirit of I'm going to pour myself into education, but our overall channel mix largely stayed the same. Organic search being an enormous driver of net new customer acquisition. And we've spent a lot of our time just doubling down on improving the customer experience and making sure that that is at a really high level and made some, some really good headway there. One area that many companies forget about, which is, is unfortunate, is their existing customers. Community growth and engagement, something of course I'm very passionate about, but is a huge driver of ongoing customer acquisition of referrals, word of mouth, brand awareness, and ultimately funnels in to help grow all of these other channels as well. This is very much a balance between getting uh, the, the automation in place to facilitate some of those sales assisted channels, but making sure as part of this that the right companies are being pushed into the right motion. So you, you probably don't want to have some of those lower LTV customers or potential customers coming into a sales assisted channel or sales assisted motion where you're going to be driving up your acquisition costs as a result of that, when actually you want to push them through uh, a, a freemium motion the, that is touchless without touching a sales rep. And I think one other big piece in all of this that we don't have time to get into is getting the balance right and the dynamic right of rep sales commissions and how this impacts incentives and all of this, especially when you're introducing a touchless sales kind of motion alongside a pre-existing sales assistant motion. I think that if you are focused on acquisition marketing, you are missing a whole huge area of growth if you're not simultaneously thinking about the retention and monetization side of things. The role of the acquisition marketer doesn't stop once you've acquired someone. It's You can't just optimize for that. And again, this is why I'm so passionate about community growth as well, is you first of all need to have really strong attribution all the way through and feeding the information on the retention and monetization of cohorts of individuals that you're bringing through back into the acquisition side. But at the same time, you need to be engaging, regularly checking in with customers, making sure they're feeling loved, that their requests are heard, and that actions taken upon them. And giving people a great customer experience directly influences your ability to acquire more. I think tying those together is, is, is essential. We've seen with the pandemic and the, the shift to remote work has pushed forward digital transformation several years now. That there is a growing need in amongst all of this that's coming in on that B2B side, that's uh, entrepreneur friendly platforms, I would say. And, and this is where we've seen a huge rise in things like the no code kind of movement. But I think the fact that Shopify's uh, shop app is now, it's now actually the 35th most downloaded free app in the App Store. That, to give context to it, that is above Uber Eats, Google Photos, Tinder, and Reddit. This, 
this tells this story pretty nicely. I think that there is, while uh, there is a lot more competition coming into this space, there is an explosion of needs to be fulfilled with software right now. When it comes to the tool I most rely on, honestly, um, it's either my Google Calendar or it's Todoist. Uh, Todoist is basically a to-do list and uh, rough project management platform, but I manage all of my tasks for work, side projects, personal tasks. I wouldn't know how to function as a human being without these, so I think it's a pretty good example of uh, online tools that I, that I truly do rely on. I think the first person on this list for me is Ben Horowitz. I have learned so much from his essays, his books. He's an incredible uh, leader, and I think the way he thinks about leadership in particular shaped a lot of my thinking. Uh, Joanna Lord is someone that I would class as a good friend, uh, and also she's the CMO over at Skyscanner, previously CMO at ClassPass. She's someone that's followed a very similar career path that I hope to follow in my own career, and uh, is an exceptional leader and someone that I look to as a real inspiration for myself and what I would like to be able to achieve. Um, two other people, I think uh, Yuval Noah Harari, the writer of Sapiens, book of uh, series of books, fascinating individual. And a completely different example would actually be Jack Dorsey, uh, a CEO of Square and Twitter. He's very multifaceted and uh, is someone that makes great predictions, which is what which he, he, he puts his money where his mouth is, which I find uh, particularly enjoyable to, to follow and impressive. I think similar to one of the, written by one of the people who I mentioned that I find very inspirational, uh, Ben Horowitz, his book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. There were, while I was reading that and rereading it, I just had so many moments of kind of connecting dots together that I'd really struggled to connect previously. And I think for anyone that's going through and developing as a, as a leader in any form, uh, there's just, uh, there's, there's times when it's quite cathartic to read. There's a few things that I always kind of come back to me. And I think that one that's held true to me, as simple as it is, is that, you know, you don't need to be the loudest person in the room to be heard. and in many ways the loudest person in the room is often not listened to and being able to spend a much greater proportion of my time listening versus speaking it's it's often much easier to get your point across and to influence things that way For all of the craziness and stress that 2020 has brought me, I have many, many more wonderful memories with, with my daughter. So that's absolutely a, a top memory for this year and for my life.